Hello, everybody. Uh, yes, yeah, so it's sort of like a recurring thing that at IPv6 Working Group, we talk about IPv4. So, but uh, I have IPv4 in the title, but I will be talking about IPv6 addresses and Quote records and situations where deploying Quote record is actually not a good thing to do. So uh, let's go, let's go uh, ahead and uh, start with the point, what is actually an IPv4 mapped address? Uh, well, I should introduce myself. My name is Ondrej Caletka. I work for RIPEN CC. I am uh, part of the RIPE meeting technical team, which is taking care of the network and everything you see here, like the presentations and stuff like that. And uh, we are trying as much as possible to remove IPv4 from our meeting network. Also for the reason that the number of devices connected to the meeting network is growing every single meeting and uh, we have our you know our ipv4 pool is limited even though it's quite uh, generous it's still limited and we would like to explore ways how to use it less and less but back to the ipv4 mapped addresses what are they uh, you probably already have seen them is there anybody who never seen address starting as colon colon ffff and then ipv4 address can you raise the hand there's a one person in the room who haven't seen it yet too. Okay, good. Uh, uh, the IPv4, IPv6 addresses like any other. Uh, the thing is, uh, it's completely valid to write IPv6 address in a way that the last 32 bits of the IPv6 uh, address would be right exactly like IPv4 address. So don't make your, don't make yourself fooled by the fact that you see IP for address at the end, it's just completely legal and valid way of writing IPv6 address. And you could also write those numbers in hex. Uh, they are invented for one particular reason, and that is IPv6, IPv4 compatibility in IPv6 socket API. And uh, I'm already apologizing in advance. It is really hard to pronounce right IP4 and IPv6. So if I make mistake by any chance, uh, just shout at me and I will uh, try to fix it. Uh, let's just quickly talk about Socket API because we are here network engineers, but I don't know how many of us have ever programmed anything that was actually uh, speaking uh, with network. So I will do a quick crash course on how to program IPv6 enabled application uh, using BSD sockets API, which is what every operating system is using basically. So let's start with the case of IPv4 client application, might be for instance web browser. Uh, if the application is IPv4 only, it's very simple. It starts with a library function socket, which will create a socket, then the call connect will uh, connect this socket to a particular IPv4 address. And once we have connected socket, we can send and receive data. That's easy. What if we want to uh, expand this up to support IPv6 as well? Well, then we have to put something in front of it that will decide whether the address that we want to connect is IPv4. And in that case, we go the same path that we went before. Or if it's v6, we go to a slightly different path with only, which only differs in that packet family or address family of the socket that we ask the operating system to create for us. The rest is basically the same. So on clients, there is no need for IP for mapped address and everything is uh, yeah, basically uh, quite straightforward and quite easy to adapt to support v6. Let's look at the server. The server has a little bit more uh, calls that, uh, so. You create socket as well, but you have to bind it to some particular address and port. And then you have to listen on that, uh, on that socket. And once you, once you do it, you will get a listening socket. And with, uh, with every single connection that comes to the listening socket, you will call an accept, which will uh, accept that connection and serve that particular connection. So in IP4 only case, it's pretty easy. It's this, it's this left part of this slide. But if you want to support IPv6, the problem here is you somehow have to support both IPv4 and IPv6 at the same time. So chances are you may spawn a different thread or different process that will do exactly the same what you do for v4, but for v6. 
But if your application that you are trying to fix for support v6 doesn't support threads, or you don't want threads or um, uh, or a forked process or anything like that for some reason, then you have an issue. So for that, you can fix this by doing it, uh, let's say, event-driven. So basically, you can prepare socket for listening on v4, then you can prepare socket for listening on v6, and after you do this, you call a system call called select or poll, which will basically tell you which of the sockets are ready for uh, accepting connection or receiving data, and then you will you will serve every single connection in, in one thread. So it's possible to do, but you can see that the application flow now became much more complex and the reason and and the reason this complexity reason that is could be stopping us from adopting uh ipv4 only applications to support ipv6 by the way i'm here talking like about situation 20 years in past nowadays this is and this is not uh not an current issue that there will be apps not supporting v6 at least not in the majority of of uh, of the things. So because of this complexity that might be unnecessary, there's this thing called IPv4 compatibility of IPv6 sockets. Uh, so IPv6 sockets might be able to receive IPv4 traffic as well. So that means you can only deploy application that will only open IPv6 socket, and yet it will be able to communicate with both IPv4 and IPv6 internet. Uh, this will make your server application simpler. So that's the, that's the reason why it was invented. Uh, the thing is, the, the application is only opening IPv6 socket regarding the API, and therefore, it only sees IPv6 addresses. But as I said, uh, the socket supports also IPv4 operation. So that is exactly the use case for IPv4 mapped IPv6 address. So basically from the socket, you will always get IPv6 address, either it's real IPv6 address, if it's IPv6 connection, or it's IPv4 mapped IPv6 address, if the connection that socket, the socket is creating is actually IPv4. Uh, it's important to stress that there is no translation happening. The operating system is talking native IPv4, uh, there is no IPv6 address existing anywhere, sorry, no IPv6 packet existing anywhere that would contain IPv4 mapped IPv6 address inside. No such thing exists. This is not a translation. This is just the way because the API is only allowing you to send you 128-bit numbers. So you have to somehow put the 32-bit number into the 128-number field, and this is how you fill it. This is the only way. There is no uh, SIIT transaction, how we know, for, uh, for instance, from, uh, from uh, NAT64. Uh, and in the end, this is not recommended. So no new applications should be relying on this. Uh, it was mostly invented for, as I said, converting old applications to support v6 with li as little effort possible. Uh, if, you, if you are writing a new application that is proper one, you should write it in a way that supports two parallel sockets open at the same time and open one socket for IPv4, which would be IPv4 socket, and one socket for IPv6 or possible more of them if you want to listen on more ports or more addresses. So all, so this is the proper solution. This is only like workaround for application that can only open one socket and work with one socket. Uh, the problem with this approach is also that you cannot trust whether IPv6 stack is actually present in your computer because there are still people who are turning IPv6 off even on operating system that are supporting it. You might have noticed that uh, Microsoft, for instance, has this uh, has this uh, uh, knowledge base article saying that if you turn off IPv6 support in uh, Windows Server, you will get it into unsupported configurations and things will break. Because even if your server is operating v6 v4 only, it still it still needs v6 inside to communicate uh, between component of it. Uh, and there is also this issue that because this has some security implications, OpenBSD deliberately de decided not to support this. So you cannot get IPv4 compatible IPv6 socket in OpenBSD. Uh, 
Now the question, I said the socket may be compatible. The IPC socket may be compatible with uh, IPv4. How this is determined? For that, there is this option that is called IPv6 v6 only, which is a socket option that every sensible application should set. It can have two states. If it's set to zero, that means the compatibility is enabled. This is the default settings for Linux or for macOS. It can be set to one, which means compatibility is disabled. That means IPv6 socket will only get IPv6 traffic and no IPv4. This is default for Windows and uh, various BSDs. And as I said, on OpenBSD, this is permanent and read-only variant. So you cannot turn you cannot turn this option off. Uh, so if you write a portable application, it should always set this uh, option one way or another, because uh, otherwise you will get problems when you run your uh, application developed on Linux on Windows or vice versa. Uh, if the compatibility is enabled, you will always uh, have, it will block the uh, similar IPv6 socket. So if you listen on IPv6 socket port uh, 80, for instance, uh, and the compatibility is enabled, you cannot listen on V4 socket with the same port number. So that was about how uh, programming IPv6 uh, uh, sockets look like. But now let's get to the interesting part and that are IPv4 mapped IPv6 addresses in the wild. So just to recap, IPv4 mapped IPv6 address just represent IPv4 address in the IPv6 only socket. It's something that should never leave the host. It should never appear in any IPv6 packet anywhere. So it would be very silly to put it, for instance, into DNS. <laughs> <laughs> Yet people are doing it. And um, uh, I would like to point out that this was not, uh, this is not my discovery. This was discovered by uh, Thomas Schaeffer, who's sitting here in this uh, room. And um, he actually started a chat with the company behind this domain name uh, to ask them why, why, they, why they put Quote record containing IP4 mapped address into their DNS together with their A record. Uh, that doesn't make any sense and it actually breaks things. I will just uh, come uh, soon to the fact why it breaks things. Uh, and I have to say that the answer in that public forum is hilarious. So I copied it in, into that slide and I will now read it verbatim. So we did this to drive down the cost of our DNS provider. Queries for quote A records that didn't exist followed by queries for A records was costing us significantly and we needed to alleviate that. Our quote A answers follow the standards and our dual stack testing has shown no issues. The IPv4 address embedded in the IPv6 answers should be accurate and should match the A record request and should all be rootable in the IPv4 space. Yeah, <laughs> I see face farming people in the in the room, and that's exactly what I what I had when I uh, read this as well. Uh, so uh, basically, the point here is that this is some German company, and as you might know, that it's uh, the de deployment of IPv6 in Germany is uh, getting uh, uh, getting better, let's say. And one side effect of it is, is that uh, client operating systems like Windows or Mac OS, they have this feature, which I personally don't really like, and that is that they are not sending out quote queries if they don't see IPv6 connectivity. And once they start seeing it, they will start sending quote queries. So basically, before IPv6 was deployed in Germany, they didn't see the issue because uh, clients were mostly querying for only A queries. But now, then some ISP has deployed v6, and the and the, uh, uh, the, the this service provider who doesn't do any v6 has uh, saw an increase of quote queries that were not answered. And I'm not sure if this is really true, but if somebody is charging per query and charging more for non-existent query than for existing query, this is quite this is quite silly. Uh, so. Yeah, let's say now we now that we laughed at this answer, let's see. Uh, this is silly, or is it actually? Now I got this second thought, and I said, well, that's something that can be easily test. So I so I set up an IPv6 only website. I already have one, but this IPv6 only website 
actually has quad eight record, but it doesn't. The quad eight record doesn't have a v six address. It has v four mapped v six address. Uh, this uh, this uh, website should be universally unreachable because putting v four mapped address v four mapped v six address into quad eight record is just stupid, and every single operating system or whatever should filter it, ignore it. Yet I can open in my browser. Uh, so then I set up another test website, which is actually dual stack, which means it has a record pointing to v4 address, and it has also a record pointing to IPv4 mapped IPv6 address somewhere else. So it, uh, it provides different content. And guess what? My operating system is preferring the quote record with the, with the uh, EV4 mapped address. So this looks like we have we have a problem. Uh, of course, the results uh, can vary. For instance, I haven't seen the problem on Android. So kudos to Android developers. Uh, I have seen different results on different operating systems, different browsers, and different networks. So for instance, this brokenness is on macOS with uh, v6 only network, but it works uh, correctly on dual stack network. Uh, but in any case, all hosts I tested are actually issuing both Quote record and A record. So one cannot save money on providing V4 addressing Quote record uh, and expecting them not to come back and ask for A record. So there are some examples here on um, with Kudel, which where you see that on dual stack network on macOS on the left, you can see that it works well. On the right hand side, you see on IPv6 only network that. Um, you somehow can connect to the squad a record containing ip4 mapped address so it seems that there is some confusion where even if it comes from quad a record as ipv6 address somewhere in the in the stack of you know the uh, stack of the operating system the operating system get confused and when once it see ip4 mapped ip6 address it will uh, convert it gracefully to ip4 native address and communicate with it instead which should not happen this is basically the reason why openbsd decided not to support this at all because there's always this risk of confusion if you are using different type of addresses for different purposes uh, the question is, is this really a problem? Because, yeah, uh, we have happy eyeballs, and happy eyeballs are uh, very successful in hiding broken IPv6 uh, connectivity. And this is just one of the many examples of broken IPv6 connectivity, because the a code record just contains uh, wrong information. Uh, it might break DNS 6.4, uh, but there's a very easy fix. And actually, in the meeting network, when DNS 6.4 is on, which will be after this session, uh, there's a there's a filtering setup that is not allowing anything else than uh, global unicast addresses in Quote records. Therefore, these addresses will be filtered by DNS resolver. But this the fact that the computer itself is let's say vulnerable. I would not call this vulnerability, but some security people might. Uh, it's a little bit concerning. So. My last slide and takeaway here is what can we do about this? Well, if you are a DNS 6.4 operator, then you should definitely set a filter, uh, set your DNS 6.4 to ignore all query records containing anything else than global unicast address space, because it doesn't make sense to have anything else in query records. Uh, if you are operating system vendor or browser vendor, yeah, maybe think about filtering like IP formapped IPv6 addresses from the input from, let's say, from DNS or even from user, because it really has this only one purpose and it shouldn't be used for anything else. Uh, if you are a DNS, uh, DNS hoster, uh, then you probably should not charge people more for empty responses than for responses with data, because then people start doing weird things. And, well, Anyone volunteering to maybe bring this to ITF because there was this problem that actually Thomas was asking on on the matter most and uh, sorry Mastodon and it was that uh, whether there is like an RFC that is clearly saying that you should not put a quad, uh, IP formapped address into DNS because apparently nobody thought somebody would be as silly to do it so nobody wrote it explicitly anywhere. 